Good afternoon and welcome to the December webinar of College Connections. I'm Dan Azera, the Alan R. Wareheim Faculty Chair in Agribusiness and the Director of Entrepreneurship and Innovation in the College of Ag Sciences. And I'll be filling in today for Dean Rick Rausch. So as many of you know, this series is designed to give you a unique inside perspective of the programs, people, priorities, and partnerships of the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences. We hope you're enjoying these opportunities to get an inside look at much of what's going on in the college. We continue to enjoy embracing this opportunity to share new topics with you each month. Before we begin, I, I would like to share with you that we are recording this session and we will be sharing it via email with those that are registered. If you know someone who would be interested in what is covered here today, we encourage you to share the recording with them. We have a dedicated web page which you can find by searching our college's website for college connections. And you will also find links to all past sessions and registration information for future events. So let's get started. I'm really excited today to be hosting and moderating this month's webinar titled From Innovation to Commercialization, Putting Research to Work. I am joined here today by Dr. Maria Spencer, John and Patty Wareheim Entrepreneur in Residence, Dr. Nina Jenkins, a professor in the Department of Entomology, and Dr. Ali DeMercy, Professor in Agricultural and Biological Engineering. We'll be giving you a more in-depth look at the college's Research Application for Innovation or RAIN grant program, which is designed to assist investigators like Nina and Ali in exploring commercialization of their research, as well as sharing some of our recent program successes. Before I turn things over to Maria, who will be giving more background on RAIN and the RAIN grant program, I wanted to take a, a moment to recognize two of our donors whose contributions have made an enduring impact in this area. First, Robert and Elizabeth Hodge, generously committed to an annual contribution that supports our ENI program as well as projects that receive RAIN grant funding. In addition, Chuck and Ellen Krieger have created the Charles R and Ellen M. Krieger Research Applications for Innovation Grant Endowment. This is the first endowment dedicated to RAIN. The generosity of the Hodges and the Kriegers has allowed many of our researchers to pursue commercialization potential of their work and has positively impacted real world problems. I'd also be remiss if I didn't recognize the Penn State Research Foundation or PISRIF. PISRIF has provided a one to two match for every $50,000 contributed by the college. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Maria Spencer, the John and Patty Wareheim Entrepreneur in Residence, who will provide a bit more information about RAIN, and then she'll introduce our presenters. So off to you, Maria. Hi, thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone, and thank you again for joining us today. Uh, my name is Maria Spencer, and it's really my privilege to help facilitate technology transfer for the College of Agricultural Sciences. Um, I have been working in research and business development around the university for more than 10 years, and uh, I was honestly thrilled to join the college in uh, 2018 because I really believe that ag is one of the most innovative colleges uh, at Penn State. And one of the most compelling examples of that innovation uh, is the RAIN grant, which was created here and has since been replicated across much of the university. Uh, the RAIN grant program makes competitive funding available to researchers who are working to commercialize their research. Uh, the funding helps bridge critical gaps like regulatory testing, um, seed cultivation for grower trials, and pilot scale production of new materials. So the RAIN grant funding can help move a project through what we call the valley of death, uh, and get it to a place where it's fundable by government or industry. Um, so when you're looking at the college's most successful entrepreneurial ventures, there's a really good chance that you're looking at a RAIN-funded project. Uh, since 2013, more than $1.2 million in RAIN grants have supported 21 projects, and a really good number of those projects have matured into startup companies and commercial licenses. Um, today, we're hearing from two researchers who have leveraged RAIN funding to move their technologies towards commercial success. Um, Dr. Nina Jenkins, whose research is the foundation of the Apprehend Biopesticide, and Dr. Ali Demirsi, whose research is opening new doors for the efficient biofermentation of vitamin K. 
So it has really and truly been my pleasure to work with both of these researchers, and I want to really thank them for making the time to join us today. Um, presenting first is Dr. Nina Jenkins. Uh, Dr. Jenkins is a research professor in the Department of Entomology, and she and her research team developed the technology behind Apprehend, which is a novel biopesticide product for the control and prevention of bed bugs. So assisted by the rain grant program, uh, her team was able to develop the technology for commercialization, and they went on to establish Canidio Tech LLC in 2014. The Penn State Research Foundation granted Canidio Tech an exclusive license to the biopesticide in 2016, and the first sales of Apprehend were realized in 2017 following regulatory approval by the EPA. So Dr. Jenkins is kind enough to share her journey from discovery to commercialization and provide an update on the successful growth, growth of Canidio Tech over the past four years. Nina, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. And frankly, it's always really exciting to hear what's new with Canidio Tech. So I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, oh, I'm excited to tell you how you're well. First of all, to explain our story and then, then to, um, to, to give you some news on how, how we're doing now. Uh, so I'll launch into this. I am going to stop my video. It distracts me if I can see myself speaking. So uh, I'll, I'll pop back up when I finish talking. So uh, yes, Apprehend is a, a, a biopesticide for the control and prevention of bed bugs. And uh, I think it's probably uh, relevant to just explain the situation that has been occurring with bed bugs in the United States over the past couple of decades. So, you know, back in the early 2000s, there began to be a bit of a resurgence with bed bugs. People hadn't really come across them for, for, for many decades. And uh, this, this nice little map with the little dots is uh, a very familiar town. This is New York City, of course. And uh, just a sort of um, a, an example of how bed bugs have been growing. These are data that were collected even back in 2011 when the, the, the bed bug resurgence was, was just beginning to be noticed. And every single red dot on that map is uh, an infestation in a private uh, residence. And the yellow dots are reported infestations of bed bugs in, in hotels and motels. So uh, even back then, we had a very high incidence of bed bugs. And, you know, if you've been interested in bed bugs and what's been going on, you may have seen these really dreadful photographs on the internet of intense infestations of bed bugs and, you know, how, how really very nasty it can look like. But actually, most people don't allow an infestation to get to this level. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not problematic. And bed bugs are, are incredibly, I don't know, they're, they're able to hide in the most extraordinarily in extraordinary places. And it may be that if you've been to an infested hotel and you do end up being unlucky and in introducing bed bugs into your sleeping environment, that you may not notice this for many months because they hide in unusual places. This is behind a, a, a power outlet. Um, and are, you know, they're not invisible to the naked eye, but they hide away from plain view. So you can miss the existence of an infestation in your home. They, they may be behind picture frames and things unless you react to bed bug bites. And bed, um, only 50% of the population do react initially to bed bug bites and, and give that sort of like typical reaction on the skin. So you can miss it. Um, uh, and they're a major problem and a lot of the chemicals are not able to deal with them because if you can't hit, hit bed bugs directly, you need something that has a really effective residual. That means that when you spray a surface and the bed bugs come into contact with the surface, that they will then be affected. And this is where Apprehend really comes into its own. And it's based on a fungal disease of insects that we've been working on for a number of years to look at other insect pests such as mosquitoes and how flies and I started out my career working on fungal biopesticides for locusts and grasshoppers. So Abraham sort of emerged out of, out of the technology that we had really always already established but then 
when we discovered that it worked against bed bugs and how it could be implemented for bed bugs, we got really excited. So this is Apprehend, this is what we sell, and we sell it alongside um, a, a spray application kit, which enables us to spray these fungal spores at very low volume application rates so that the, the product is invisible and undetectable once it's been applied. And this is how it works. So we're spraying the, the, the product as a residual and barriers where we know that the bed bugs will walk. And when they cross these barriers, they then pick up the fungal spores. And you can see those all, the way, all over the front leg of a bed bug here. There's the gray dots. Um, what happens once they've contacted an insect is because they're specialist fungal pathogens of insects is that they're triggered to germinate. And you can see the spores here germinating and penetrating directly through the cuticle of the bed bug. And here we've got this, this little diagram showing you what happens. We've got direct penetration and then the fungus is growing in the hemolymph or the blood system of the bed bug. And it takes about three to seven days to kill a bed bug once it's come into contact with the fungal spores. So this is how it's used. We uh, recommend Apprehend for use in controlling in existing bed bug infestations, but also it can be used to prevent the establishment of bed bugs introduced. For example, in a hotel room where they can't prevent people from checking in with bed bugs. You can apply the barriers where you, in the areas where you know the bed bugs will walk, and that will remain effective for three months. So you can basically um, protect your hotel room uh, over a period of three months and have quarterly reapplications once those, but that, that those barriers have been applied. So you're not actually um, generating infestations in a hotel. So if we imagine that this has been sprayed uh, in, a, in an infestation, what happens is the barriers go down in all of these areas where we know the bed bugs will walk. When they emerge from their hidden harborages where we can't get to them, they cross those barriers, those green barriers, pick up the spores, but then additionally, they go back to the harborage where they're hidden and they can spread those spores amongst others in their population. So we generate this kind of uh, epidemic and we're all very familiar with epidemics these days, right? So the advantages of using Apprehend over traditional methods of bed bug control are that Apprehend can actually control an infestation after just a single application. Uh, this is unheard of. Normally chemicals need to be required, uh, need to be applied three to four times in order to achieve eradication of a bed bug infestation. And that's incredibly disruptive for the homeowner. Um, we also re require only very minimal homeowner preparation uh, in, uh, for an application of Apprehend because we don't want to disrupt the normal behavior of the bed bugs. So we recommend vacuuming of the bed bugs that the pest management professional can see and then a application of these, these barriers. And even if there's a lot of clutter, these barriers still work. Um, so you just live normally and you can um, bring the, the infestation under control with these, these very robust barriers. So it'll work in cluttered environments. It can be used as this the preventative treatment for in the hospitality industry. And it can be sold um, rightfully as a natural um, product with a non-toxic mode of action. And of course, we all hear about chemical resistance building, building up in insect populations. There's, there's no cross resistance uh, to apprehend if bed bugs are resistant to other chemicals and no reports of, of any, any insect actually gaining resistance to a fungal pathogen. So these are what you might call our, you know, our, our sales points or our value um, propositions for the Apprehend product. So how much did it cost to commercialize? Well, we got funding from the RAIN grant um, program and I'll be going into a little bit of detail of what, as to what we use th those funds for. We also got some Techcelerator prize money. This is the, the Techcelerator course that we, we did. Uh, it's run by the Ben Franklin Technology Partners, which was marvelous and really transformed us from, from research scientists to entrepreneurs. Um, we got some money from the, the Ben Franklin Big Idea contest. Uh, we managed to um, secure a private investor who, um, who contacted us through um, publicity that was put out by the university and, and pledged and gave us 150000 to, to kickstart our, 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 um, our company. And also Ben Franklin um, 
provided loans to uh, a total of 250,000 to get us started. And we've actually repaid those loans in full already. So we estimate that the total cost to start up uh, was about $480. $5,000 uh, to get uh, uh, Canidia Tech up and running and selling Apprehend. So the timeline for that was that we, we discovered in 2011 that our technology was useful for bed bugs and was very effective. Uh, and that triggered our patent application, which we put via the college and the, the, the Penn State Re Research Foundation that enabled us to submit that patent application. In 2013, we got the, the RAIN grant fund, funding and joined the Techcelerator Entrepreneurship course. We established Canidia Tech in 2014 and we started that regulatory process, submitted our dossier in 2016 and got registration in 2017, which then enabled us to set up uh, um, our headquarters for Canidia Tech in Centre Hall. Um, we launched the product and started selling the product at the end of 2017. Then, weirdly, finally, we got our patent allowance in 2018 and uh, we followed our registration process through into Canada. And that's been a real boost for us uh, in 2020. 2021, well, I've got our third uh, quarter uh, annual um, gross revenue, which was over a million dollars. So. If we annualize that into the future, um, we, we could say that we have an annualized revenue of maybe $4 million. That's looking into the future 12 months. So uh, things have been pretty going pretty well for Canidia Tech since our product launch in 2017. With respect to the RAIN grant, well, you know, our major barrier to commercializing this product was the regulatory requirements. Uh, all pesticides in the United States have to be registered by the EPA. And there are some very specific and pretty convoluted requirements that we had to go through to enable us um, uh, um, uh, the, the um, construction of our regulatory dossier for consideration by the EPA. So our RAIN grant application really basically requested the assistance of a regulatory consultant to guide us through that regulatory process. The EPA don't want to hear questions from scientists. Uh, they do listen to regulatory consultants. And of course, they're familiar with the processes for the uh, EPA. So we needed that. We needed to do the acute toxicity testing, um, which is done by a third party lab, obviously, because it involves animals. Um, there's a, a specific six pack of tests that have to be done for any um, biopesticide or chemical pesticide that, that is registered by the EPA. Um, and that, that is a set fee. It was cost us back then uh, $21,500 to have those tests done. And only when we got the results of those tests did we know whether we, we had the green light to go ahead, write the dossier and submit it to, to the EPA. Um, the, there were submission fees and we also um, needed support to support my postdoc um, to do all of the other studies that would, did not involve rats and rabbits um, in order to provide the data for our regulatory dossier. So we were at that, that rain grant and able to do us to do all of those things and to submit our dossier by January 2016. And as I say, we got that final EPA registration in April 2017. So what's the impact been since we have started selling Apprehend? Well, you know, we calculate through the numbers of bottles that we've sold that over 300,000 homes in the United States and Canada have been treated successfully with Apprehend since our launch. Um, that has changed the lives of many people. We've heard from uh, pest management professionals that were battling bed bug infestations in multifamily housing unsuccessfully for years on years and not gaining control of those infestations. But with the advent of Apprehend and the implementation of that, enabling them to do both proactive and um, re reactive treatments, they've managed to solve these um, massive bed bug infestations in multifamily housing by implementing Apprehend. So, you know, we really have had a major, major impact on, pe on people who have been affected by bed bugs. 
We've got over 8,500 licensed pest management professionals using Apprehend, and we do only sell to licensed professionals because you really do need to understand bed bug biology and then have that basis to understand how to strategically implement uh, Apprehend in you know, in somebody's home. So we only sell to licensed pest management professionals, uh, but they are doing a fantastic job with the product. Uh, we're finding, um, and they are reporting back to us, that they are getting increased profitability over what they um, had experienced for charging for bed bug jobs using chemicals and or heat. Uh, and they're experiencing growth opportunities because now that they, they can offer a proactive treatment or a preventative treatment for the hospitality industry. And uh, they're actually building their business um, on the basis of the use of Apprehend. Of course, another impact is that in Pennsylvania, we have one new company, that's Canidia Tech. And we employ uh, five individuals, three of those are part-time. Um, and actually three of those are full-time and two of those are part-time, I apologize. Um, and uh, we, we Overall, there's a, now a reduced risk uh, for travel and the, the um, chances of picking up bed bugs because more and more of the hospitality industry managers are actually requesting this quarterly proactive treatment. So what is the importance of rain grant program? Well, for us, it really did remove that barrier to commercialization. Once we had that money, we were able to use that regulatory consultant to guide us through the regulatory process and establish that our product would be safe for implementation in people's homes. Uh, it reduced the risk of, um, you know, of commercialization for us and uh, you know, enabled our private investor to invest in us with, without you know, major risk of loss of his, his, uh, his, um, his investment. Um, you know, it aligns with and adds to this wider Invent Penn State initiative that we are really fortunate to have in the university. Um, you know, the, the, the combination of support that we have through Ben Franklin, Invent Penn State, at the College of Ag, RAIN and RAIN Grant, program and uh, PISRIF is fantastic. And that really does enable us to, um, you know, to commercialize our, our technology. Um, and we were able to utilize and license back our own patent. So that patent, you know, didn't sit on PISRIF's desk, uh, waiting for somebody to pick, up, pick it up we were able to actually license it back and drive that technology forwards. And I, in our case, I really believe that we were the right team to do that rather than touting that patent and the technology out to larger chemical companies who really may not have understood how Apprehend could really work for them. Uh, we get great support and advice from the college's entrepreneurship team and, and in return the college actually gets a return on investment so our licensing fee that, that, that we pay or the, the agreement uh, means that on a, on a, on a, a semi-annual basis we pay a percentage of the gross annual sales or, or the gross sales of Apprehend and that money goes back into the college to reinvest into the RAIN grant program and to support the um, you know, the entrepreneurship team in their job. So we're incredibly grateful for them. And, and we hope that as, as we grow and our, the, our returns that we return to them in, in form of our licensing fee um, go on to support the further development of this fantastic program. So that's really all I have to say. And I guess I'll, I'll hand back to Maria, stop sharing and reveal myself once more. Thank you so much, Nina. I, I have to tell you, you've taken so much of the stress out of traveling for me, and I, I'm so grateful for your work and, and for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next, I would like to introduce Dr. Ali Demirsi. Uh, so Dr. Demirsi is a professor of agricultural and biological engineering and the professor in charge of the CSL Bearing Fermentation Facility. Uh, his teaching and research focus on Microbio, or microbiological engineering, including bioprocessing of value-added products via microbial fermentation and the inactivation of pathogenic microorganisms in food and the environment through non, novel non-thermal processing methods. Dr. Demirsi holds two U.S. patents and has authored or co-authored more than 160 refereed journal articles 
40 book chapters, uh, and he has also edited three books. Dr. Demircy was awarded a RAIN grant in 2020, which he leveraged to attract an industry co-sponsor for his work in improving the efficiency of producing vitamin K. So Dr. Demircy, thank you so much for making the time to be with us today and to share more about this work. Well, thank you so much for this kind introduction. It is my pleasure to talk uh, what we have been doing uh, on our uh, one of recent projects. But uh, based on what I heard from the previous uh, project that uh, introduced, we seem to be still infancy of our uh, target. But I think this kind of effort takes time and uh, slowly but surely we'll reach the goal that we are hoping to get. So as you saw uh, uh, slide that Dr. Jenkins saw, it took more than 10 years to make this commercial. So I think uh, we are in the right path, but you are gonna hear from my presentation, it is still in uh, infancy. Uh, so let's see uh, uh, how you like. Well, uh, before I go into the presentation, uh, I would like to introduce my co-investigator, Dr. Aiden Berengian who work on the project in the last one year as a postdoc. And he is actually associate professor in University of Waikato in uh, New Zealand. So he's been a collaborator in this project since the day one. So also Dr. Esan Martina, he was a PhD student, uh, work on this project. He is now a assistant professor in Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Services in Albany, New York. So with that, uh, I will start the presentation. So as we all know, vitamins are uh, general organic compounds and they are very important for our metabolisms. And most of them, we cannot uh, synthesize them or produce them in significant quantities in our body. Therefore, they must be obtained in diet. So there are a total of 13 vitamins well known and they are usually categorized as fat and water solubles. If you look at the water solubles one, I'm sure you are familiar with many of those, vitamin B1, B2, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C, uh, niacin, they are all water soluble, and they have each individual functions uh, and in our metabolism to help us out. So in terms of the fat solubles, we have four vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And I'm gonna focus on vitamin K in this presentation. So vitamin K discovered by Henrik Dam in 1935, it is a fat soluble and it has two main uh, types, vitamin K1, phylloquinone, and vitamin K2, menaquinone. Phylloquinone is actually the plant source. Menaquinones are the microbial and the animal source. It comes from the egg and green leaves, the vitamin K1. And vitamin K also uh, plentifully full available in a Japanese uh, fermented food, food called natto. So out of the vitamin K2, uh, they will have different subcategories, one to 14 and seven is, seems to be the one most, most attractive to us because they are superior to other forms in terms of their half-life and their absorptions. So vitamin MK7 uh, is produced by this microorganism, Bacillus subtilis natto. So uh, as we also know, uh, there is a lot of disease that humankind being uh, faced and one of them is cardiovascular disease, millions of deaths per year, and worldwide costs over a trillion dollar. And osteoporosis, also a very important disease, one out of two uh, women and one out of three men over 60 affected with this, and the worldwide cost in the uh, matter of billions of dollars. So this vitamin MK7, menacurin 7, is very effective in prevention of osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease. Actually, with the latest studies, it has been shown that vitamin K2 is very effective in recovery of the COVID-19 patients. Therefore, we really need to uh, produce this in high amounts that we can 
provide to the public at low cost. But unfortunately, as of now, a kilogram of pure vitamin MK7 is about three and a half million dollars. Basically, it is more expensive than gold. So why is this so expensive? Partly because of the production method that the industry currently using, because they use this kind of shell, I mean, shelf fermentation, they fill the shelves and they incubate it statically in a chamber like this. The reason is for that on the surface of the liquid, the biofilm of the bacteria is being produced where the vitamin uh, K is secreted. So, but if you wanna make this more bigger production scale, we need to make the shelves larger and larger, but we cannot make the shelf large enough like as big as a beaver stadium. So we need to really find ways to commercialize this much more uh, scalable and high capability, capability level. So the, uh, the literally the million dollar question is then how to produce these large quantities of MK7 economically. So in our lab, we've been working in the last two decades a special bioreactor design called biofilm reactors. So these biofilm reactors have this special solid supports and we tie them on a shaft in a grid-like fashion. And when the shaft rotates, this supports already also rotate on them. So basically how you make this uh, plastic support, we mix the polypropylene plastic with some agricultural byproducts and then mix them and extrude it at high temperature and we can get them in the shape of these pipes then these pipes can be connected to the shaft like this. And then during the fermentation, biofilm grow on them and we can increase the uh, microbial population uh, as, this, as the biofilm formation. So basically as the shaft rotates, this biofilm rotates with it. So this gives us an idea then, here you go. We can really then uh, meet the demand of the biofilm formation of the vitamin K production and also still agitated. And uh, this idea came to us uh, several years ago, then we've been working uh, for a few years. And this one slide is actually summary of the three year uh, uh, length of work that we have done in this topic. So this is the vitamin K production when we do the static fermentation in shelves. You see, it keeps the 30, uh, slightly above 30 milligram per liter. As soon as we shake them, the production decreased dramatically. So that's where you can produce or if you start to agitate and shake the reactor. So with our biofilm research and with uh, optimization goes with it like media and different types of the fermentation modes, now at the end of our research, we were able to get very similar production that the uh, static fermentation do. Then you might be wonder why you are so proud of yourself, you get the same level than the static fermentation does. Well, remember, we have a problem in scaling this up if it is static, but if we produce the same amount in an agitated reactor, then we can build a reactor as big as like a skyscraper. So therefore it is really important for us to agitate the reactor to produce this product. So we were very pleased to see this uh, achievements and with our search, uh, we found out no IP has been uh, granted in this area. So we basically uh, submitted a provisional patent application in, at the end of the uh, 2018 and 2019, December, we converted that to PCT application. So with the Office of Entrepreneurship and Commercialization at Penn State, now we are building a relationship with the industry, specifically with this biggest Manekunan 7 manufacturer in the world. So they were so interested in our invention, but the bottleneck or the uh, biggest question they want to know before they license our uh, technology, they said, can you scale this up? Is this scalable? Of course, everything we have done so far was in a small benched up reactors with the volume of two and a half liter. So we need to really 
show them that this is scalable at larger volumes. So where now then the rain grant comes to our picture. So we submitted an application to rain grant and they were, uh, we were really appreciative that they understand the importance of this project and they funded us. That's why in the last one year we've been working on showing to the industry that this technology can be scaled up. So now after that, they might be, they might be maybe interested in doing that. So the research as we speak going on in our uh, CSL bearing fermentation facility, pilot reactors that we have over there, that facility is housed in egg engineering building that we have. Uh, so we are lucky to have that uh, facility to operate uh, through the proof of concept to the industry. So basically after that research or uh, proof is completed, we are hoping to transfer the technology to the industry for the new businesses. So with that, I really appreciate the support of the RAIN grant to make this project go from bench to the pilot scale. Hopefully company will show more interest and we can uh, try this in the real uh, commercial production line. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please get back to us. And this is my email and this is the website. And again, I appreciate the, uh, all the hard work of my collaborators and uh, principal investigators. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you for the work uh, that you and your team are doing. And thank you for your time today in this presentation. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Dan uh, so that we can take any questions from our guests. So thanks Maria, and Nina and, and Ali uh, for helping us better understand our rain grant program in the college. And as Maria pointed out, uh, now we will answer your questions. Some were submitted early, but we will be answering questions that you may have uh, as a result of the presentations. So please enter those in the chat box if you have uh, additional questions. So the first question we received was related to the RAIN grant program. So I'm gonna uh, turn that one over to Maria. Thanks. Uh, so the first question I have re relates to um, funding specific to graduate students um, and graduate students supporting the research. Um, and you know the, the answer to that is through the generosity of, of donors, we actually have funding that is earmarked for graduate students to get involved in this type of research. Um, and frankly, it's, it's, it's critical that we do engage our grad students in this work because um, grad students are often the first employees of a startup company. So when there is an entrepreneurial effort, it's often the grad students that um, you know, that make those first important steps forward. So um, again, we're very, very fortunate through the generosity of our donors um, to actually have funding. Um, we're launching it for the first time uh, in 2022. We have dedicated RAIN grant funding for projects that directly engage graduate students. Okay, thanks Maria. Uh, the second question we received uh, is in regard to uh, Invent Penn State and the launch boxes. So is E and I uh, collaborating with Invent Penn State and uh, the launch boxes? And if so, in what ways? So uh, yes, um, our program in the college is collaborating with Invent Penn State. Uh, we work closely with D James Delatra, who is the Vice President of uh, Entrepreneurship and Commercialization in the Invent Penn State organization. And we're involved in a couple of uh, initiatives, for example, uh, one would be the um, uh, Penn State uh, Week, which would be in the spring, uh, where this is Penn State Startup Week where mentors and entrepreneurs that are out in the uh, working world come and help students and mentor them, give talks. Our students uh, participate in pitch contests and uh, get involved in various activities. Uh, we're also involved with uh, helping our entrepreneurs, particularly at the faculty level, uh, identify uh, potential mentors and business partners. This is through the um, Startup Leadership Network that's established through Invent Penn State. 
And then, and then Penn State has broad um, access to a variety of resources, uh, money for summer programs, uh, and many, many opportunities. So uh, we wanted to be part of the Invent Penn State program as well. Uh, we used to talk about kind of being a module that fits into Invent Penn State and uh, helps make it work. As far as the launch boxes go, uh, the launch boxes, uh, as you may know, are across the state. But we uh, work closely with the Happy Valley launch box here in State College. And our faculty and students can uh, work with the launch boxes to develop a business model, to get legal advice, uh, and other uh, types of support resources that entrepreneurs need as they go about their journey. So um, within Penn State is a critical part of our, of our program and we leverage all the opportunities we can with them to, to help our faculty, staff, and students commercialize their research. Then I also forgot to mention that since the question came with the, about the Invent Penn State, our project was selected one of the eight best inventions at Penn State last year by Invent Penn State. So they had the IP invention and IP conference back in April last year that we have presented this work. So basically they help us to publicize this uh, technology to the industry uh, participants at that conference. So that's another good, I think, example to how we link ourselves with the Invent Penn State uh, collaboration. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, what is the greatest challenge that you have faced as a faculty innovator entrepreneur and how were you able to advance onward? So, you know, maybe I can turn that over to uh, Nina and Ali to answer. Uh, again, what is the greatest challenge that you have faced as a faculty innovator entrepreneur and how were you able to advance onward? Nina, I'll give you a chance to, to answer that one. That's an interesting question, actually, because I'm not sure that I have really had any major challenges. I mean, I think already what I said about the RAIN grant program, getting us over that barrier, um, you know, to, to the regulatory process, I mean, that was significant. And there was certainly nobody who could help me within the, um, the university environment with respect to how to navigate that regulatory process. We really did need an external um, consultant to help us to do that. Um, and I, but that, that was the solution basically, that was a challenge. And we, we found the solution, which was fantastic. I suppose if I'm thinking about other implications of being both a researcher and, and an entrepreneur, um, we also have to be very careful about conflict of interest. So, um, you know, we have the conflict of interest office and uh, we have to fill out the, all of the information about our, our company interests and those um, where it may tie in with our um, grant funding that comes in. So, you know, I have a little bit more, um, I don't know, a few more requirements when it comes to applying for grants and things to, to think about whether there is a, a, you know, a real conflict of interest that may prevent me from applying for a grant. But in most cases, it's really just about making sure that I filled out all of the, the relevant information to this, this conflict of interest board where they can ensure that everybody's interests are protected and that nobody is deemed liable, whether it's the university, myself, um, you know, for any, any perceived conflict. So, you know, it's really useful that we have that process and, and I don't see it as a major impediment, but it is an important element now that I do have these, these other things going on in addition to my grant funding. I think that's all I've got to say. Yeah, thank you, Nia. Okay. Ali, do you have any comment about the greatest challenges? Well, you uh, I think the most challenge or the most important barrier is with us as the faculty. So we are academic researchers. We are not trained to be a businessman or we are not trained to be an entrepreneur at all. So I think when we do research, we just focus on graduating students publishing and presenting and we think we are done after that. 
So I think we need to change our mindset as a faculty member. And we need to look for opportunity, how we can commercialize any research that we have done if as a value for the industry or commercialization. I think university recognize this. That's why the Invent Penn State uh, initiative in place and our college put your office uh, together. So you've been helping us tremendously in the last decade. I think with all these great uh, initiatives, we started to change our mind. So this is one or two examples you have listened today, but I'm sure there are a lot to talk about it. So I'm looking at the future will be much different than what it was 10, 20 years ago. And thank you for that encouragement to all of us. Oh, thank you. And uh, for your, your uh, support of our program and for you know, your invention, because without your invention, we, uh, we'd have uh, no one to, to take forward and commercialize. Uh, Maria, any comments uh, based on Ali's uh, suggestion? Yeah, I, you know, I just, I guess I'll reiterate, it's been such a pleasure to work with both you and, and Nina um, over the years. So I'm, um, you know, it's, it's really been my pleasure and I appreciate all the work that's coming out of the college and, uh, you know, would love to see more. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, I'd love to look at the patents associated with these projects. Uh, I'm a patent attorney and a Food Science 74 grad. Can you share publication numbers? Uh, certainly, um, we can share the, the, uh, the patent publication numbers with you. Uh, if you could um, send your contact information uh, in the chat, uh, we'll have one of our hosts um, uh, copy that and, and provide that to us. Yeah, I think uh, it looks like Greta Roman uh, just shared it in the chat, uh, at least for Nina. And I uh, will have to take a look for Ali's. Okay, great. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, good. Thanks, Greta. Yeah, thanks. And there was another question about the launch uh, boxes. Uh, what is the relationship between RAIN and the PSU Innovation uh, launch boxes? Uh, like I mentioned, there's the support, resource support for um, faculty, students, um, where they need it. But another uh, area that we see uh, interaction with the launch boxes is just in research. Uh, if you think about the location of the launch boxes throughout Pennsylvania uh, and the opportunity to study the communities where they reside and how entrepreneurship occurs in those communities, we have a number of uh, PIs that are interested in the entrepreneurial ecosystem or the community where entrepreneurship takes place. So in addition to providing resources for inventors to help them commercialize, there are also uh, uh, opportunity for us to study communities where they reside and learn more about how entrepreneurs work in those communities. So that's, uh, that's been an interesting, uh, interesting way to look at the launch boxes as well. Let's see if there's any other questions. Uh, okay, so Nina, this one's for you. Uh, where is Apprehend being manufactured and is it a continuous operation? Nice question. So we were, we were really delighted to find a small industrial unit just uh, along the road from Penn State. It's out towards Center Hall, if you're familiar with that, our area. It's on, on Route 45, very close to the Round Barn. Um, so we operate out of that little factory um, and uh, we do the formulation. So basically we mix up the spores with the, the, the proprietary oil formulation uh, and we bottle it uh, on site and, and then we send it out both through a distribution network. We have various chemical distributors that sell our product and we also sell direct to um, pest management professionals who, who don't have a, a rep in their area. Uh, so we do that, but we, uh, you know, we import all of the all the raw, raw materials to to our factory. Uh, I say import; that's probably the wrong word because uh, all of the raw materials for Apprehend are made in the U.S. 
so that's that's great. It's an entirely US manufactured product. The only thing that we do import is the components for our spray kit, and a lot of those come from China. And we put that together in our factory as well um, and, and ship that out with, with the product. So it's really great to be close to Penn State. And, you know, and I have maintained my position here as a research professor. Um, I work 80% here uh, and then add, add on um, so realistically more than 20% of my time to Canadia Tech as well. So I'm pretty busy, but uh, it's great. And I love to do both jobs and I think they feed into each other very well. Thank you. So I don't see any other questions at this time. Last chance, if anybody wants to ask a last minute question. Uh, here's, here's one. Uh, and again, Nina, for you is, I think it's going to show up here in the in the chat. I lost it here. Okay. Um, is every hand approved by the Pennsylvania Bureau of Betting and Upholstery? Um, almost certainly not. Oh, I think I would know about it. And um, I wonder I wonder what that that approval would would actually um, whether that's something that we should look into. Uh, we don't actually apply apprehend to bedding, uh, but we do apply it to upholstery. So, um, or no, I say we, pest management professionals do. So uh, if the, the person who asked that question uh, would like to follow up with me, if that seems like a, a thing that we should, we, we should investigate further, then I'd be more than happy to do that. Okay, great. And we did uh, post the uh, contact information for everyone, so. Um, that'd be perfect uh, to get in contact with you. All right, so I'm looking one more time uh, and I think we uh, have answered all the questions. So um, uh, I guess it's time for us to, to wrap things up. Uh, so I wanna thank all of our speakers today for, for joining me in uh, talking about our Rain Grant program. And we want to thank you, the audience, for attending and uh, participating in our question and, and answer uh, time. Um, if you'd like to learn more about how you can support RAIN and uh, uh, ENI and the College of Ag Sciences, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly or the college's development office. Before you log off, please make note of the next session on your screen set for January, January 19th. Uh, town, town Hall Discussion, State of Pennsylvania Agriculture, featuring uh, uh, Russell Redding and Rick Rausch, Dean of the College of Agricultural Sciences. And I think most of you know that Russell Redding is the Secretary of Agriculture for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So thank you again to everyone for joining us today. We wish you a safe and, and healthy holiday season, and we'll see you again in 2022. Thank you.